Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've been using my Celestron Dew Heater Ring on and off and have a couple of observations I wanted to share with you that may lead to a solution to this problem we're having with it having an adverse effect on our star shapes. Let's get started. A lot of us are seeing star artifacts on our brightest stars in our images when we're using the Celestron Dew Heater Ring. And in some cases, we're also seeing star bloat. Just every star in the field of view gets larger as the power to the Dew Heater Ring is increased. And maybe there's a fix for this. There's a couple of observations that I came across that I want to share with you in this presentation. Another thing that I've been interested in solving is that I've been getting these very badly shaped guide stars through my off-axis guider after making some changes to the imaging train. And so I figured, well, I've got one clear night left and I'm not involved in any projects right now, so I might as well do some testing to try to address these two issues. First things first, let's just get rid of the imaging train issue and the guide stars. What I did was to go back to the Celestron uh, SCT adapter that goes with their off-axis guider. It's that conical looking thing that uh, comes with the off-axis guider. I've got that made it up here with a one inch long SCT spacer, and then I moved a M48 10 millimeter spacer back here behind the camera. So that moves the camera forward means the prism is seeing more of the light from the center of the field of view. And also, I'm not being constrained by that M48 adapter that I was using up here in the front. Instead, I've got the SCT opening here, and then this conical section here just expands. So there's no impingement of light, if in fact that was happening before. And I'm finding I'm getting better guide star. I still have the fundamental issue of the boomerang effect, because you can see the two peaks here, but it's a lot better than what I'm seeing back here. So I'm not sure why this improvement or this change improved the guide stars, and I'm not sure if there aren't some other effects going on. I need to explore that a little bit more, but at least I feel like I'm getting back to the near circular stars that I had before. This is a night when I was doing some imaging, and what you're looking at is the current throughout the night as recorded by the Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box. So you can see the whole history here. These spikes are slews as I slew to a star to do some focusing, maybe slew up to the meridian to do a calibration for the guide star. Then finally, we go into a step here where I turn on the cooler for the camera and start imaging throughout the night. I go to bed and this spike here is the meridian flip. But I wake up at four o'clock in the morning realizing that, oh no, I had forgotten to turn on the dew heater and it was a night where I was expecting to get some dew. So in a panic, I wake up, bang on the dew heater ring to 100% power and then go back to bed. We slew back home and we're done for the night. So what I want to do is to take a close look at this section of the graph and you can see here's the step when I turn on the dew heater and the image I took before without the dew heater on, look like this. So there's no spike here. It's one note. The second thing about this image is the this left edge of the image is equal to the point on the timeline down here when that image started, when that exposure started. And the length of the picture here corresponds to the length on the timeline for the duration of the exposure. So it's a five minute exposure that I was taking. So this one is taken with the dew heater off. Then about after four minutes of already exposing into this second subframe here, I turn on the dew heater. So most of the light that you're seeing in this image was in a condition like this, and yet I can see that spike appear almost immediately. One of the big assumptions we've had as we think about this problem with the dew heater ring is that it's just putting out too much heat and it's causing the corrector plate to warp slightly, which affects its focus. And when I saw this picture, what this tells me is that, no, this is actually a local effect. There isn't time in the 60 seconds or so for the heat at the dew ring to propagate all the way through the corrector plate and cause it to warp. The picture that came immediately after this, so now the picture has been exposed for five minutes, you're not seeing any significant difference between these two pictures here. There's just not enough time for the heating element to heat the whole corrector plate and cause this effect. So maybe we're not dealing with a heated corrector plate issue, we're dealing with a local effect of the dew heater ring. Now here's the image I had with the heater off, so you can see what the star size is, no artifact here that we can uh, detect. Now with the heater on for five minutes, so this is that third picture in the image, you can see I've got the spike quite clearly here. 
I would say that there's not a heck of a lot of star bloat, though I suspect there is some in these other two stars here, but I am certainly seeing the spike come in that a lot of us see when you go to high power, maybe over 50% power. And now when you compare this 300 second exposure to the exposure where most of the time was spent without the dew heater on, only 60 seconds roughly of that of this exposure has the dew heater. You can see that the spike is certainly there, and it's a bit stronger over here, but there's not a significant difference. And as far as star bloat goes, I think it looks basically the same in these two uh, cases here. So I'm not seeing a lot of that. For all intents and purposes, one minute is equal to five minutes in terms of exposure time. There's another observation from Deep Space Dave, who chimed in on an earlier video about this topic. And he had come up with a brilliant observation that I have totally missed. He was able to identify that there is a gap in the corrector plate support underneath the corrector plate. So inside the tube, his gap is at 5 o'clock and at 11 o'clock. And those gaps perfectly align with the spikes. So let's go over to my SCT and take a look at what Dave's talking about here. I'm in the home position. So this is up and the red material you see around here is my do not do strap, which I always leave attached to the scope anyway. Some nights I will just run with the do strap, and some nights when I think do is going to be a problem, I'll hit it with the do uh, heater ring. What Dave is talking about is this piece that's under here. You can see the edge here. We have the do ring obviously up here, corrector plate here, but underneath this piece of material you're seeing here is underneath corrector plate, and it supports the corrector plate. And if you follow that piece all the way around, it doesn't make a full 180. It's just a it's just a partial arc here of the circle. And this edge and this edge for the similar pieces on the other side make up that gap that Dave is talking about. So here's the five o'clock gap. Here's the eleven o'clock gap. And if you go into the uh, PowerPoint here, you can measure this angle at about 40 degrees is what I'm coming up with here. And if you look at a picture, and by the way, the picture is aligned the way the camera was aligned on the back of the, uh, the scope at this time when I was imaging this target, you can see that we have this spike, which if you measure the angle of that spike, it's about 40 degrees. And so that's a little more than a coincidence, plus you add Dave's ob observation on there as well. And so what I'm guessing is that this spike feature is associated with, caused by this gap in the support behind the corrector plate. And that if we presumably had a full 360 support around the corrector plate, we wouldn't be seeing the spike feature. So it certainly looks like, based on Dave's observations and what I'm seeing here, the gap in the corrector plate support behind the corrector plate is actually the, the source of the spikes that we're seeing in our stars when we turn on the dew heater. We're dealing with something that's very localized around here in the ring and perhaps localized to only here and here. And maybe that suggests a way we could fix this. Well, I tried to fix this. It didn't go well. Here's my corrector plate. I'm very dusty, as you can see. This is, I don't know why, but my corrector plate just collects a lot of dust. You can see the dew heater ring here. Here's that gap we were just talking about here. So what I thought we were having is maybe some diffraction off the edges, this discontinuity here that's producing the spike that we're seeing. And perhaps there's some glow being given off by the dew ring all the way around, and that's giving rise to the star bloat. Alternatively, the gap in the light here could just be producing the star bloat and the spike. So what I found on the internet was some wiring harness tape that is often used to uh, capture wires inside engine compartments and automobiles. So it's heat-resistant tape. If you feel the stuff, it feels like a cloth kind of texture to it. And then what I figured I would do is cut off like an inch and a half of it in strips, start on the bottom of the dew heater ring here and wrap around the edge and come back around. So I have two layers of the tape on the bottom where the heating element is, one layer on the top. And when I do that, this is what the dew ring looks like. I did this 360 all the way around and that way I can get a more or less uniform contact between the dew heater ring and the corrector plate. Now, one last comment, don't do this at home. I make the mistake so that you don't have to. The center of the heart nebula has some nice bright stars that are brighter than the ones I was looking at in the bubble nebula, but also has some fainter stars. A lot of good stars to look at here in terms of uh, performing a test with the, this taped over dew heater ring. And here's the test that I did. Start the fan here to cool the camera down, apply 100% power to the dew heater ring, and I'm imaging here at about 50 seconds, so 50 second duration images. In here I switched to 150 second 
exposure times and then to 300 second exposure times. And then I bring the power down to 50% and bring it down again to 25% and then close up shop for the night. A good series of images here, three different exposure times and three different maybe four different power settings if you include 0% as a power setting. Well, here's what the stars look like without the dew heater on. So we have a 50 second exposure, no dew heater power, and here's what it looks like when 100% power is applied. Clearly you can see there's star bloat pretty much in every star here. The spike is not as well defined as it was with the bubble nebula version, in other words the non-taped over dew heater ring. So I don't consider this a success in any form. It's just, uh, it just kind of blurred things out a bit. We still have quite a bit of image artifact here that we have to contend with. So the tape is definitely not a successful solution to this problem here. But just for the sake of discussion, we can look at the other effects that we have. This is a comparison of 25% power versus 50%. You can see at 50%, we're starting to get that spike. We don't really see the spike appear at 25%. I suspect you might be able to get through most nights with the power set at 25%, and maybe on the worst nights, somewhere between 25% and 50%. And just for the academic interest, here's the comparison between 50% and 100%. You're getting that full spike effect here, and it's forming here at 50%. This is kind of a history here of the full width at half maximum of all the images I was taking. And so when I was operating at 0% power, exposure of 50 seconds, Roughly speaking, there's an average of what my full width at half maximum was for those images. Then I turn on the power 100%, and you can see there's an immediate jump in the full width at half maximum. And I increase the exposure time to 150 seconds, so I'm getting even a bigger jump in the exposure because now we've got more of that bad light, if you call it that, from the dew heater ring, and we're just adding more of that light to the image. And then finally, at 300 seconds, I'm getting a full width at half maximum that's really quite high. And then coming down the other side, now I've got the 300 second exposure is a constant, but I've cut the power down by 50%. So you can see that it is having a significant effect on the full width and half maximum and come down to 25%. And I can see a, an increment there as well. As you can see, the power is having a big effect on the bloat of the star, the full width at half maximum. The key thing to remember is that when we see this star bloat and this full width at half maximum increase, with the dew heater on, that means that we are losing resolution in our images. So it's not just ugly stars, it's affecting the detail that we're trying to pull out of galaxy spiral arms or edges of nebulosity in, in nebula. Now, as many of us know and have observed, the Celestron dew heater ring is producing artifacts on stars, but it's also, as I said, throughout the image. We get larger stars, we get uh, even spikes appearing when we go to very high power with the dew heater rings. It's really having a negative impact on our images, but it does prevent dew. Given the choice of having no dew and some affected images, well, I guess you'd take the affected images versus no image at all. The star spikes are one thing that we can probably get rid of if we could get a full ring, a full 360 support ring behind the corrector plate. And one of the things that I noticed when I was doing that imaging is that these things, these features appear almost immediately. There is no time for the corrector plate as a whole to heat up and warp and affect the focus. It's just a local effect confined at the ring, which again points the finger back at that gap underneath the corrector plate. So I figured if I can't replace the partial rings that support the corrector plate from behind, and maybe I would try covering up or wrapping the dew heater ring in a heat resistant opaque tape to see if that could uh, forestall some of these effects, the spikes and the star bloat. And as you saw, that did not work at all. But now you're left with, well, what do I do? How do I work around this? If you're gonna continue to work with the dew heater ring, as I say, it does prevent dew, maybe consider uh, taking a series of images with the dew heater ring off just to get enough data for the stars and then set those aside, turn the dew heater ring on, collect the data for the remainder of the target and the nebulosity, and just hope that if you're using the dew heater ring at a low enough power setting, you won't get a significant increase in the full width at half maximum, and therefore you'll maintain as much resolution as possible. And then in post-processing, take out those bloated stars and replace them with the good stars 
that you got with the dew heater ring power set to zero. There is still another option, and that is to use the traditional dew strap. My dew strap had been working quite well, so I may go out and buy an additional dew strap, and then that should cover the 5% of the nights when I need the extra protection. I just wish Celestron would do some of this testing so that we didn't have to. On the positive side, we were able to confirm that the old definition of disaster, i.e. from Latin meaning bad star, still applies. Take care. See ya.